Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hey, everybody. So we're going to get to our episode in just a second, but I wanted to make sure that you heard about my latest offering because people have been asking, how can I work with Jolie? And I would love to work with you, but you all have such individual relationships. So I would love to see you pop into my next free live training. It's the best way. Yeah. My it's eyes, right, directly, your relationship. These are small intimate groups. We're just going to meet in Zoom and we're going to talk about what it is that you want and how you can get it. Go to my website, joliehamilton.com. Click on the work with Jolie tab. You'll see some live trainings and master classes coming up. Grab a spot at the next one and we'll see you in there. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. And we're going to talk about friendship. Friendship. Which sounds like it would be light and fluffy, but instead it's probably going to be a little more intense at times because friendship is, well, for me, pretty much the same thing as any other relationship. I don't, I don't, um, I don't totally understand the delineations between friendship romance and, and romance and marriage and partnership and life committed partners and and when I say I don't understand, I mean, I understand that other people use these words and I use these words too, but I'm really aware of the fact that we are always making the relationships that we have, that we're in them, literally creating them. Yeah. And there is no, there is no such thing as a friendship. You can't just point to yeah, a right. friendship and say, it's like that. They're no. all unique. So... This might get all over the place. Okay. And I was excited to talk to you about it because there's this whole weird concept of like being married to your best friend. Yeah. And when I say weird concept, like I like the idea, but I think we should pull it apart a little bit. Yeah. I think that's worth doing. And I, I think, okay. Um, I learned this trick from you. What does married mean? <laughs> Okay, okay, so married to my best friend. What does married mean in that? It, so I think when I hear this phrase used the most frequently, it's used in people who've who participated in a, a state sanctioned marriage ceremony, okay. a religious right. and, and or state sanctioned marriage ceremony. And generally speaking, <laughs> there's some talk about how I'm marrying my best friend and it's very aspirational to be married to your best friend. Like that's what that's a goal. That's the goal. Okay. Hashtag goals. Right. Hashtag relationship goals. Okay. And here I sit in a um, state sanctioned, spiritually connected marriage. Mm, yes, we are. And I could definitely call you my best friend. Okay. I don't usually. I, I have shied away from the label best friend. I okay. recently was using it again with someone who I'm, uh, who I'm no longer friends with now. And the word best friend, I think has always, I've always had trouble with it. I have always struggled with the term best friend the same way you have struggled with favorite. <laughs> See where that's going. Yeah. Right. right? Yeah. So when we were first dating, I would ask you in a, what I meant to be a totally benign way, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite dessert? What's your favorite color? I love asking people favorites questions, but I think of favorites as like, give me your answer for right now. Yep. Understanding that I believe that all things are always up for negotiation. Um, my favorite color happens to be May 26th. Your favorite color happens yeah. to be May 26th. Yes, okay. That's my Understood. favorite color. Um, it's my favorite color. If you go out into my backyard on May 26th, you yep. will see the color green. That is my favorite color. It's the okay. color of my wedding dress when I married you yep. as well. That color. That's it. Somehow I heard that as when I married you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that. <laughs> um, I... I love favorites, but I, they get to change. So that's my favorite yeah. color, but it's also my favorite answer for that color. 
And so on any given day, I mean, today my favorite color is goldenrod yellow. That, okay. that really bright, juicy, not into the butternut squash yet, but mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm, I'm loving that color right today, the right actually, now. The actual color of the, the goldenrod golden that's rod out in, that's the in the field. Right. Field. And that's okay with me. Best friend has uh, it. The phrase has completely like sent me into panic because I would ask you what your favorite was. And you would think I was asking you to like be, that's it. it. You were committed forever. If you said the color purple, that was going to be on a test later. Also, I wouldn't ever be able to change it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and possibly I was going to like change your whole wardrobe to be that color or something. I don't know. Ramifications. There would be consequences to the choice. And so when As I though, would say the if word... If you could only ever see one color forever, what color would it be? Ah! Oh, please don't do that. <laughs> you would freeze. And I could see it happen on your face. I would ask you a favorites question. You would freeze. And yep. so I started talking to you about... So I'm just... I. That's just me saying, what do you like? Yeah. What do you, what do you like? What right. are you interested in? And one of our kids has that exact same reaction to favorites questions. Yeah. You ask him a favorite and he's like his mind appears to go blank and overwhelm all at the same time. He's like, oh, no. Um, just, uh, I, something just popped up. FOMO. Fear of missing like, out of the other colors. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. As an artist though, I'm never afraid that my palette will run dry. Right. I, so, okay. So favorites and best friends. Okay. So best friends. Have affected us in, in similar yep. ways. All right. Best friend to me has had this sort of connotation of being superlative only one, right? Just like favorite can have that. So I just reimagined what the word favorite meant like years and years and years ago, but I didn't reimagine what the word best friend meant, the phrase best friend meant. And so I thought it meant something pretty unique like there there would be just one of them. Mm-hmm. Maybe even because we live in this very serial monogamous world maybe like a, maybe there would be different best friends at different phases of life but mm-hmm. i think i had thought of them as one one offs that is that is not panned out like when i go out into the world and I, when i talk to people about friends that's not how most people seem to be using that phrase and when we're talking about um especially cisgendered heterosexual marriages if somebody says oh i'm married to my best friend that they, they often have a best friend they also have a best friend yeah often of mm-hmm. their same gender and of a gender that they're not attracted to so like it's so this has yeah. been very confusing for me and has confused me about what it means to even have friends because we aren't monogamous and that sort of influences everything else so why was i i put like a monogamous imagination onto the concept of best friend yeah right you did very like if you have a best friend, that's your best friend. And I worked on releasing myself from that over the last decade, but it's been a challenge um, because I think the way I worked on releasing myself from it was to not really have any sort of like top tier friends, any a like really close to me friends until just a few years ago. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Am I your best husband? So far. <laughs> Well, I was thinking about the overlap of marriage and friendship. Yeah. You okay. Know, and... Okay. So yes, it and you are my best husband, and I expect you to be better. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, I don't think that I totally understood what it was I was looking for in friendships when I was thinking about whether you were my best friend. So I there, here we get into the weeds, right? It's. Mm-hmm. What does it mean to have a best friend who you're married to and you share um, probably uh, an erotic story with and you share finances with and you probably you may share parenting with and right you share all of those things and then you have a best friend who probably you don't share finances with probably you don't share sex with probably you don't share parenting with probably you don't share bank accounts with wait a minute so are these two actually two totally separate things that we just use the same word for what happened? Or is this just an Instagram fluke and people started p- putting, you know, hashtag married to my, married my best friend and, and like it became a thing or is this part of the monogamous imagination? Like, well, I'm going to be married to my best friend. This person is going to be my, my 
my person and oh. like they are going to be the person i turn to for everything okay um which can be a lot of pressure for a lot it of people for a lot can. of people that feels like a lot to take on especially as we grow and change so what am i your best friend yes you are my best friend of the friends that i have had in my life you're doing it best like my experience of you is best I'm looking at don't, him with a lot of side eye. Don't don't eat your, your <laughs> laces there. <laughs> um, so, but so one of the reasons that you are but my I don't feel like your best friend. Best friend. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> no, I, I don't must be because, doing something. But I think it's because um, I focus on the way we overlap in these other ways where we're like sharing finances and parenting. So I I think I focus on our anchor partnership. Oh, so maybe. It, is is that what this phrase is used for to identify the fact that in addition to the cultural structure of a marriage also this person is my friend because oh, okay. it's not required it's not okay that's interesting so when we think about the history of marriage um the the way we imagine marriage right now this like you're married to your best friend and and you do this this the common picture is like this person is going to be someone i enjoy in many different aspects, many different yeah. parts of my life. Yeah. But you only have to go back 150 years to see a very different reason. Survival marriages, um, profit marriages, um, the, the marriages of property owners That's and what royalty. Marriage was. Right. That was yeah. the purpose of it in many cultures across many times. And so it's really there's only like 150 years in like Western european and american culture where we can say yeah you know you get married to somebody who you really like and you want to spend time with and you have a lot of overlapping interests with and 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 um, and you expect to deepen your intimate bonds with over time some people in those other in those other forms in the in a property-based marriage or in a survival basement some of them may have found love deep and abiding love and some of them may have found deep and abiding friendship but it wasn't the reason yeah. that they necessarily connected. Yeah. So maybe maybe it's related to that. Maybe it's the order of the relationship. Order of operations. We were best friends first. first and then we got married. Except you and I were not actually best friends first. We were a murky set of other things. But we don't go around saying I'm married to my best friend either. That's true. This is fascinating. Yeah, it is. What? So what the heck is friendship? So I have been working on a model... Um, presented by Shasta Nelson in the book Friendtimacy, um, this idea that friendship requires um, a three-legged triangle of the bottom, the base of the triangle is positive interactions. And then the two, um, it's an equilateral triangle, hopefully. And mm -hmm. the two other um, faces of it are vulnerability and consistency. So consistency is about how frequently do you have contact? What kind of contact? How do you show up? And and what what happens? Um, like literally, do you text? Do you go places together? Like how do you interact? And how frequently do you interact? Vulnerability being how how intimate can how how much sharing can there be? And how reciprocal is it? Or is it very one sided? Is there is there an asymmetry in mm -hmm. the way that sharing happens? And then the base of the triangle um, in Nelson's model is that positive interactions. She based that, um, as I understand it, on the, the Gottman's model of um, John and Julie Gottman's research on marriages, which there are plenty of problems with um, from a non monogamous perspective. But for the purposes of this discussion, they did find very clearly that relationships with high satisfaction ratings did they those came from from relationships where there was a five to one positive to negative interactions ratio. So you want to have about five positive interactions and those may be very small micro interactions to the to one negative or or detrimental or problematic one. Okay. And so the idea that like you just want there to be an overall positive experience um a place where we see this in friendship show up uh is people who get together only to talk trash about other people 
Okay. That, that doesn't, yeah, that, it doesn't create a solid base <laughs> because the, the base of the friendship is about complaining. And so that's not the, well, it's really hard. How do you put the, so you, you could have the complaining and you could even have consistency. Like we get together to bitch about mm, shit okay. consistently, but it's gonna be really hard to be vulnerable. How are you going to be vulnerable with each other? If the baseline of the relating is complaining about really, other people's behavior is really or whatever. problematically yeah. negative mm -hmm. overall negative not that i want to slip into the idea like toxic positivity is a real thing the idea that um you know you should always think positive and all negative thoughts are a problem let's just not be silly of, of course of course negative stuff quite happens, a bit but, more complicated right than that. but okay let's say we're working on from this model of friendship within that model of friendship i would say Wow, yeah, our, our friendship triangle is exquisitely um, symmetrical and well-filled. Awesome. High five. Awesome. But um, I haven't always had that with other people. I still struggle with that. Making friends as adults is um, not as easy as I, I don't know. Actually, I didn't think it was going to be easy. My parents didn't have friends. They really struggled with friendships. My, my dad had more friends than my mom by a long shot, but they tended to be work colleagues. Um, and yeah, like we never, there were never dinner guests at our house ever, not ever where there were never parties or like hangouts or people coming for coffee or like yeah. My my parents just didn't do that. My mom okay. had some fear about people. So I didn't have models. And then in high school, I had I had some lovely friends. Some of them might even be listening to this because I still know a few of them. Um, and they're lovely people. But we didn't... I don't think we really thought about designing our friendships or anything. Who does in high no, school? No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, but as an adult, boy, I found it challenging. And one of the ways I found it challenging is that... Um, people change people change and grow and um i something that i value in in friendship is loyalty and a willingness to work through the hard stuff which is yeah. i think people find it ironic so just because i'm non-monogamous and I, I experienced that as an orientation like i experience it as like this is just me i'm going to fall in love with lots of people mm -hmm. But just because of that doesn't mean that I let go of lots of people. I value the transition between the ways that we relate far more than like this all or nothing. I'm either all in or all out. Okay. So you're, so, so you'll, you'll transition from romance to friendship and yeah, so, friendship to romance and let the, well, and, and far more than that, not just like romance to friendship, but within friendship. So you and I were friends for years. Then we were, then we were much closer friends. Like there was a, there was a point in our friendship where we went from being the kind of people yeah. who hung out at parties and chatted to being the kind of people who, when, I mean, you were, you had some moments where you were really screwing up. Like you were not doing things well. Yes. And I was one of the people who would go and, and sit on a, a log and say uh so which is friendly behavior you. yep there's you we being my yeah, friend i see you you are um you're causing problems that are rippling out into the world do you want some help with that mm -hmm. and so different um intensities of friendship i guess i would say okay yeah and i i think i just thought that that was sort of what adults did that there was a sort a sort of loyalty that comes along with being an adult friend that I haven't actually seen play out. What I've seen is in fact, people will, um, or at least, and this is my experience. My, my experience is that, um, people see friendships as just having run their course and then they're done and they move on. They're like, okay, and they're not, they don't, they're not, they don't seem to be mad about it, but they're like, nope, not spending any time with you. And some frequently, this is a, a full stop to from best friends. So this has happened to me three times where somebody's like, yeah, we are best friends. And then all of a sudden one week we aren't anymore. I find that shocking 
because there's no cultural container for that. Right. When you're married or even when you're like seriously dating someone, there is a, there's a phrase, there's a breakup. There's a, there's a thing to talk about and say, oh my gosh, my whole world just turned on a dime. And it turns out friendship breakups are a thing. Friendship breakups are a thing. And one of the things that I did better this last time. So before I made friends with my last best friend, um, at the very beginning of it, I told her that I really didn't want to get ghosted. I I really hoped that she would at least tell me if she was going to ditch. So we had the breakup conversation at the beginning of the relationship, which I strongly recommend. Like if you're dating or if you're making friendships, it absolutely makes a difference to say, what you'll, what do you need at the, at the end for closure? Um, and I thought to do this because I had been ghosted by, by a whole, a whole bunch of people. It was over a dozen people who just dropped out of my life at my divorce. And it was so painful because they didn't explain what was happening. So I had told this person, I had told my, um, my best friend, um, that, yeah, I just wanted to know what was happening. And, um, so she did that. She fulfilled that at the end of our friendship, she called me and said, so our friendship has run its course and, and I'm not interested in spending time with you or being in connection with you. I've been grieving that now for a couple of months or, well, it's yeah, a little while, several weeks, but, um, I didn't know that that's just what happens. What's up with that? So this is a questioning episode for me because I, I think of, of friendship as being expansive and that we can, that, that the, the, the process of working through varying needs and shifting grounds and, and changes, the changes of, of moving, of, of parenting, of, of going through different life phases of grieving, of growing businesses and all of that. I think of it as, well, we're going to have different needs. So let's be in negotiation all the time. Let's just keep at that. And sometimes that may even mean that you need a break from a friendship to do other things. Um, I, I, um, what's with this all or nothing thinking? Well, so, um, we've talked about marriage itself and how it, the marriage can take on its own autonomy, its own life and be ascribed responsibilities right. in, in, and obligations. In non-monogamy, and, that becomes called couples privilege. Right. Where like the, yeah. the marriage gets its own vote on what yeah. happens. Yeah. But, a, a, but a, another aspect of that fact is that the marriage actually gets relied on too. It just is. It doesn't require effort. I mean, and so you're it not should, necessarily... It, it doesn't. Sh- well, the you marriage, can, you can the, the relationship between the two people who are married requires energy and attention oh. but the presence of the marriage can make it so people don't bother i don't have to relate to you I can we're, just married. we're married we're married i just lean on the marriage and i remember when i was younger that that's sort of how friendships were you just were friends you didn't have to do anything about it you didn't have to maintain it you just went off and did things had fun and that was it you didn't talk about anything you didn't i mean this was um my experience yeah. of being um growing up as a male type person in the, um, around here. I mean, I talk about all the time, the fact that we don't, nobody teaches us how to love well. Right. Yeah. We don't get taught how to friend well either. No. And I've spent a lot of time over the last, um, decade thinking about this and reading about it and, um, looking up the research to see what it means to be adult friends and what we, how we could do it better. And, for me, applying the rules of non-monogamy makes sense to friendships because most of us recognize that even if we have a quote unquote best friend, even if we're keeping a monogamous mindset and we only use the word best friend for one person, most of us don't expect to have only one friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so the rules, the, the guidelines, the, the moves, that's what it is. The moves of consensual non-monogamy where we, we talk about, we negotiate, we ask for what we need. We take responsibility for our own, for our own stuff and own the fact that sometimes, um, we have to make a transition. I think of that as all really well suited to friendship. Yeah. 
but friendships also seem profoundly disposable right now. And maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just because I've just been broken up with a couple times in a row. Been a rough summer. Jeez. Um, but I is the disposability, um, is that an essential feature of, of friendship that I've just been missing? Or is disposability something uh, something that's happening because we we live in a world where it just feels like we have endless choices and mm. so we don't need to hold on to things um i that, would welcome any thoughts yeah, people have this, this is a awesome. this is a fascinating topic to me that i have been struggling with for years and i thought i'd really gotten a hold of it i thought i'd really developed a uh, an intentional friendship and so when this person just just done it was over i got the thanos snap um <laughs> man Ouch. Yeah. i did though i mean it was just over and and it was unilaterally decided i there were um she couldn't tell me why uh just following a feeling yeah and so there it was done i so i clearly am missing something there. so the you mentioned it seems to be an all or nothing thing and that's when i was thinking about the 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 marriage and how we did we just don't necessary we can just lean on the marriage so if you apply that to friendship then there's okay so we're friends but we don't there's there's a a way of thinking about it where the friendship just sort of exists or it doesn't if you don't know if i don't know how to maintain a friendship like if i don't have a, like you said a way of doing friendship well and it stops working and, it's, and i'm not getting what i want out of it I don't know what to do about it other than to just end it. It's, it's, it's yeah, a thought. I, guess, I don't know. I, I, don't I know. guess so. Um, so this one was different because there was intentionality. In fact, there it was based on that yeah, particular book. That's it was true. Based on so the that, that doesn't book. apply so, there. And, and, I, and I mean, I, the reason I feel comfortable speaking about it publicly is because we did speak about it. I co-hosted her yeah. podcast and, and we talked about it over and over and over again publicly. It wasn't at all what I was expecting. And so... I am dealing with the fallout from it personally with lots of, you know, there's lots of feelings, but professionally, I also feel how there's, there are some big lessons in here for me around how do we actually allow ourselves to gracefully transition and what does it mean to be engaged with people who, whose go-to move is to leave? Mm -hmm. Because I have had a history of making friends with people who, when things get uncomfortable and they don't know what to do, they leave. And so that's the part I'm claiming for myself. Oh, okay. You know what? I don't, that doesn't really work for me. So I'm, I'm putting some, some time and energy into how I select people to hang out with and, and what the word loyalty means to me. Because for me, it's about being allowed to make mistakes or, or whatever, or experience change and, and transform and experience the change. And that's how I live my marriage with you. I have no idea if we will stay married. I have no idea if we will stay sexual partners. I don't know whether we'll be sexual partners next month, let alone 10 years from now. And I stay in the ambiguity of that yep. in the, I don't know, but I know I want to relate to you. So I'll stay in the discussion. I'll stay in this, this place where we keep working on what works for both of us. And if that means that we had to say live separately, okay. And that was actually what I had hoped for during the dissolution of both of our first marriages. Yeah. I had hoped to remain friends and yep. um, haven't been able to maintain that. And it's been hard. I um, at different times throughout the last 12 years, we've managed to be friends or I've managed to be friends um, with each of them at times, but not all the time. And I, I never really know why, but maybe that's one of the things about friendship. There, it appears that in, at least the way I've experienced it, there are questions that just can't get asked. Um, I can ask you anything but we've established that I can ask you anything. Yeah. But I guess too, adult relationships just are inherently insecure. I can't ask someone to stay at detriment to themselves. Yeah. And so yeah. this is living with the reality that endings are inevitable. 
change is inevitable, then I can make peace with that, even while I'm I'm sad. And I probably sound pretty stable right now, but I've I've cried, you know, dozens Lots. of hours this yeah. summer, yeah, um, over over this loss, and and I feel stable and also grateful that. I'm willing to be present to the the things that I don't like, don't appreciate about how this went so that I know how to ask for better next time. And the, the conversation is... Uh, Not giving up on realize, friendship, though I was tempted briefly. It, it's starting to look to me like uh, conversation. The conversation is the friendship. The actions are the things that... Well, if that the conversation sort of, is the marriage, yeah. then tell me, dear God, the conversation has to be the friendship, right? Yeah. Okay. I don't know what else to say. So we asked a lot of questions and you're welcome to ask us too. You can email me at Jolie at JolieHamilton.com or Ken at Ken at JolieHamilton.com. And uh, yeah, until we have a better answer, just keep talking to each other. Hey, everybody. So we've talked quite a bit about how to do relationships, but I know a lot of you would really like to get my eyes on your relationship specifically. It's so worth it. And yeah, that's a bit of a hard thing for me to do for everyone individually, unless you're actually working in my coaching program. But good news, I'm doing some free live trainings. Yay! Yay. Live that's, trainings. that's awesome. I mean, I get it all the time. I'm with you all the time. It's I get true. lots of training and and You are just in one so... big free live training. And oh wait, I'm... you pay for it. Okay, maybe I pay for a little, but you don't have to. <laughs> okay, so I would love to to have y'all click on over to my website, JolieHamilton.com. And if you click on the tab that says Work with Jolie, you're going to see my latest offering for a live training. These are 60-minute masterclasses in how we can relate better. I'm going to be covering topics like creative monogamy, like how to transition into consensual non-monogamy, if that's your thing. And I'm also going to be talking about something that is really in my wheelhouse and something that we don't talk about on this show as often as we might, which is how to have a completely kick-ass relationship that really empowers you to be your full CEO mm -hmm. power player self. Right. So in my other world, I do a lot of business coaching. So bring it on. Bring it on. And you've all here heard us talking about our relationship and you have heard how she has addressed all of our issues in our relationship and how we talk about it. And she will turn that attention on you. And it is amazing what you can learn. Well, thanks. And yeah, just jump on over. Love to see you in there. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the Entrepreneur's Action Plan for Passionate, Sustainable Love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft, or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>